Good evening, everyone. Good evening to Mr. Peter Ong, Mr. George Yu, Dean Danny, Professor Yako, Professor Peter, Professor Terence, and Ms. Lin Suling. And good evening to distinguished guests, friends, and students, hopefully students, uh, of LKYSPP. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the book launch of Governing Well, Reflections on Singapore and Beyond by Professor Terence Ho. Uh, before we start, I thought that it might be apt that since this is a book about reflections, I ought to offer some reflection as an MC uh, that I've done my homework and I've read the book. <laughs> uh, the purpose of a reflection is for us to explore and examine ourselves so that we can chart a better way forward. Uh, what would this require? It requires intellectual humility, thoughtfulness, and careful study. And I think this is what Prof. Terence had done through this book. It has also inspired me to follow his example. So maybe I can give you an example. So as a young adult, um, we care a lot about chickens. So when I hear about the GST increase, obviously I get very upset, right? Uh, cold storage chicken two years ago used to be $4.90. Today it's uh, $6.90 on a good day. So I've already started to experience you know, the impact of GST and inflation. But after reading his essay on why the need to raise GST now, which you can find in his book, I feel that I can better understand the reason behind it. I don't feel exactly happy, but at least I can understand. Right? So I can go on and on about the price of chickens and the different policy dilemmas with regards to chickens, but I thought it might be best to maybe pass the mic over to someone who has been here since, uh, who has been serving the Singapore government, who has been a civil servant, since everyone was raising their own chickens, right? Uh, this man is a seasoned policy maker. Uh, he's, he's been the former head of, he was the head of civil service when I was still a kid, when I was still maybe, you know, learning how to walk. So I think, you know, this Chinese saying goes that, you know, the, the, the learned elder eats more salt than the young man eats his rice, right? So this man is, is the right person to actually give you his reflection on uh, Prof. Terence's book. So maybe, maybe I can uh, welcome Prof. Lin. Probably you can take the mic, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I don't know, I just see these names. I suppose you have to, I have to address you, you know, Ms. Peter Ong, Mr. George Yeo, and <laughs> <laughs> Dean, Professor Yusuf, and everyone else. Um, okay, I, I, I was asked to just um, uh, make some remarks. I didn't know that I was supposed to review the book. But anyway, that's not, that's not the point, right? What I want to say is this, you know, as a starting position, have we ever thought about it? What's the difference between a 4 by 100 meter relay and a soccer game? Both are team sports, mm -hmm. but the point about 4 by 100 meter relay is with the manager or the coach, you chose the two best runners for the curve, two best runners for the straight. You make them practice like men to make sure the baton doesn't, doesn't fall and get, and they connect with each other correctly, and then you win the race. But what about a soccer game? Soccer game is one, you can't tell the player what to do. Depends on where the ball comes from, depends on the speed the ball comes to you, depends on where your teammates are, depends where the opposing team is, depends whether you're in a penalty box, depends whether you know you're supposed to get into the, the opposition's um, goal, right? So what can you do as a manager or coach? You can make sure that everybody is physically fit, you can make sure that they learn about ball control, you want to make sure they all know the rules of the game, you all want to make sure that you know about the team, and you're supposed to get the ball into the goal. It's, not a, it's a matter of positioning where you go rather than it's just for your own glory. Big difference between the two. But to me, you know, if, we, if I look at the whole issue about governance, it's like saying, well, how do you score a goal? But before you can do that, you have to ask yourself the question, what game am I playing? And is the game different that I'm playing today as opposed to the game maybe I've been playing 30 years ago? because it makes a big difference as to what you should be doing. We can be outlining the, you know, the whole idea is to win the game. Okay, nobody disputes that. But what do you do? What do you tell your team? How do you strategize most particularly? What's our belief as how we're going to win as a team? That changes. So what you do can change even though your principles keep going and it doesn't sound like different. It sounds like the same. So that's the point about reflection to me as, I, as we talk about governing or governing well. You know, 30 years ago, when 
as a government, you think about what you'd like to do for the long term in order to create the best possible Singapore for the future. In many ways, what you're trying to do, you can see somewhere in the world. You are third world, you travel somewhere in the first world and you see something nice. Even though you see something nice, maybe the intention are nice, maybe the way they go about doing it is not effective, it's not efficient. So you come back with the idea that that's what we really ought to do for Singapore. And so we become this collector of good ideas from all over the world. Maybe we improve on the methods. We go some good way in which you operate as whole of government. And so we begin to have this idea. How do I go from third world to first world? Just collect the great ideas from the first world. And I have this collection of, of great goals to go by. And you put it all together and say, that's my special formula. And you get there. But today, your first work, 30 years from now, is trying to get somewhere where you can't see. 30 years from now, is you trying to get somewhere where other people also want to try to get, but you have no idea whether you're thinking the same thing or not, because nobody can see. We are now entering into a dimension where the demands on imagination and on creativity are going to be life and death. It's a different game, but what is it going to be? And how are you going to create in your mind those goals? And how are you going to get people, at least within the government? It's not necessarily something you go tell, have to speak to the public about. At the end of the day, the public, when they go to the general election, they vote for you or against you, depending on whether they, like, they are happy or not happy with you at that point. They don't vote for you because you've got a third, great 30-year idea. That 30-year idea is way too far into the future. And yet, within the process of government itself, you need a way by which you imagine. And you become comfortable with creating. And you come to get comfortable with, with thinking about that kind of future you want to get to. Now, to me, this is an enormous challenge. You know, actually, Singapore already had principles of governance clearly set out. At least it was clearly set up in 2014 by our Prime Minister when he gave a speech, I think, to Commonwealth Public Services. The first principle of which the leadership is key. There's nothing for us to be unhappy with that about. After all, you are hoping all the time that you are having leaders who are worthy of their responsibilities and their commitment. The second is reward for work and work for reward, which really is a statement about saying, we believe that people should be, should, should be rewarded according to their performance, according to their contribution, uh, and that people should not be getting benefits uh, due to you know, nepotism or because of wealth or connections or whatever. There's a third principle which says um, um, a state for everyone, opportunities for all. Again, it's, it's a general statement which, for which I see very little reason to object to. There's a, there, and there's a fourth which says, anticipate change and stay relevant, which is a great statement about, you might even say longevity in politics, but definitely in terms of being able to have a consistent line into the future because you're all the time thinking about the future and yet you have to stay relevant as you go. As I think about it, actually these four principles are, I think, quite have been quite carefully thought through, quite carefully crafted. If you had to ask me, I see no reason to change from them, although I noticed that the government itself has stopped using reward for work and work for reward. I do not know why. Maybe they feel that that sounds a bit too harsh or too, whatever it is. It's now replaced, I think, by meritocracy, which I find a lot more difficult to understand. <laughs> uh, but anyway, these are all you know, about, about words. At the end of the day, it is the ref it is the interpretation of the words into real policy and actual action which define for you what you actually mean. But what I want to say is that as I look back on these principles, I think they are quite solid and they would represent in many ways the governing principles. If you have any good government, if it seeks to do what is really good for the people, what is very good for the nation, uh, something which, which gives us a consistent line pushing away into the future, I think we'll come to this, more or less, these four principles. The real key 
is not about the principles of governance, to my mind. It is about how do you, how do you see changes are taking place? How do you redefine the parameters about, um, about which you have to work on? And that is going to define for you, therefore, a different approach or a different way of perceiving uh, what the challenges are and different way of, of um, serving the people, even though the principles, I think, are good and they remain unchanged. So today, you know, to me, it is really, really good to have people like Terence who are keen about seeing to and contributing in whatever way possible to a great future for Singapore and Singaporeans. It's great to have people like him who are not thwarted by ideas being rejected, but who are energized by this, you know, by the very fact that ideas are expressed. And if we are right, just stay with it, because one day you'll be proved right, even if it is not recognized for today. Maybe, I mean, that, that has always been in my perspective. What we earnestly require, therefore, again, is a clarity. What, what game are we in today? Are we in a game in which you choose your best runners, and then you work on them, and they win the game for you? Or are we in a game in which you are really trying to make everyone as fit as you can possibly get them to be. And then say, I hope you understand, it's not a game you just play on your own. It's a game we all work together on. But we need to be clear what the goal is. And we need to be clear in many ways, actually, the goalposts themselves keep moving. And we need to be clear about being aware of changes taking place, being alert to the new things that are happening and the way, at the end of the day, to have that agility to make the adjustments as you go. So, so I just leave with that thought, that at the end of the day, when we talk about governing and we talk about governance, even if the words we use to express our ideas remain unchanged, but the contents change, the expression of the principles change, because they change when you begin to see that actually the game is a different one and the goal is a different one. Thank you very much and congratulations, Terry. Thank you, Prof Lim, and a very warm welcome to everyone here. Thank you so much for spending your Tuesday afternoon, almost evening, uh, here with me at this uh, book launch. It means very much to me because among you are my current and former colleagues, uh, bosses, mentors, and friends whom I've known, some of you I've known for a long time. Thank you for joining with me and also sharing your wisdom with me along the way. And for those whom I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, I hope we have a chance to speak later and maybe continue the interaction. Now, I wanted to say that um, I'm particularly grateful to Prof Lim Seong Guan and Ms Lin Su Ling uh, for being here with me. Prof Lim was the head of civil service when I first joined the public sector back in 2002. He was already a legendary figure then, um, who inspired many uh, generations of civil servants with his, uh, by his people-centered leadership. Su Ling, I had the privilege of being colleagues with at the Ministry of Finance. And since she left the public sector, she has forged a very um, remarkable career in the media, first at CNA and more recently at Straits Times. So thank you to Prof Lim and to Su Ling. I'm also gonna say that I'm very happy to be actually speaking after Prof Lim. That's because I think he's given us uh, much food for thought with his really big picture that he sketched out. And so this has taken all the pressure off me because I know everybody has been really well fed with his words of wisdom. And so I can share from my more limited experience uh, some of the factors I think are necessary for success of a state. So as we are well aware in the Lee Kuan Yew School, we can't just uh, transplant policies and ideas from Singapore to other parts of the world without consideration for the context, for the uh, institutions and culture and so on. But two books I've come across have attempted to actually join the dots across geography, across time, to distill some of the key factors that are uh, important for a state to be successful and sustainable. The first is a 2012 book called uh, Why Nations Fail by economist Darren Ajimolu and uh, James, I think, Robinson. And in this book, they posit that they draw a contrast between two types of states, one which has inclusive economic and political institutions, and they contrast this with uh, states which have extractive institutions that benefit only a few. 
And so no surprises that the states that achieve prosperity and success are the ones with the inclusive institutions. Another book I came across is a 2011 book by Francis Fukuyama, a well-known uh, political scientist. And this book is called The Origins of Political Order. And he identifies three factors that are necessary for stable and successful um, political um, yeah, states. So these three factors are, first of all, having a strong and modern state, one that's able to exercise control and authority within the geographic bounds of the, of the state. The second is the rule of law. And the third is accountability to the people. So after reflecting on um, you know, the, the works of these two authors and also looking around at the world today and where we are, I would like to offer my own uh, short summary of four factors I think would be really important for the success of a state. And I'm going to um, describe them very briefly. The first is openness and connectivity. That means openness to trade, to technology, ideas, and talent. Um, the second being social cohesion. The third, public accountability. And the fourth, a culture of respect. So let me explain each of these very briefly. I think the first, we all appreciate that um, connectivity, that openness has been vital to the progress of civilization. And there's so many examples in history. We can think of the role of trade in uh, the Tang Dynasty in China. We think of the um, modernization of Japan through assimilation of best ideas during, during the Meiji Restoration. And in terms of flow of people, in the 20th century, we've seen the migration of top scientific minds from Europe to the United States and how that has powered um, the rise of the US as a scientific and technology powerhouse. And even in Singapore's own experience since 1965, um, we've had tremendous success through our policy of attracting foreign direct investment and embarking on export-led industrialization. And as we all know, um, openness and connectivity remain critical for Singapore to overcome the inherent limitations of our land and population size. Now, the second factor, um, social cohesion, is one which I think many countries are struggling with today. And one of the key drivers for that is actually the erosion, or rather, of, of social cohesion has been the social economic divide, where people feel that the playing field is not quite level. They don't have fair opportunities to progress. And then there are also the traditional fault lines of race, uh, religion, language, culture, identity. And added to this, uh, particularly pernicious, is political polarization, where um, partisan interests are being upheld, even at the expense of national good. The third factor, public accountability, is something that encompasses various things, in my mind, at least the checks and balances, uh, the rule of law. And these are needed for, to prevent the abuse of power as well as to avoid the traps of groupthink of policy blind spots. And I think we need transparency in decision making to have the kind of trust uh, in the government, in the executive. Um, and this is so critical. So finally, I think, um, yeah, I w uh, just on the topic still on social cohesion, I would say it's not just the sort of law, the legal forms of checks and balances, but also how these are implemented uh, in practice. So for me, a litmus test would be what happens when there's a major lapse or something goes wrong. Um, one way, of course, the government can respond is by trying to cover up by silencing the whistleblowers or repressing any dissenters. But that just leads to an escalating cycle of further obfuscation and repression. And of course, um, the other way would be if the government finds it in its interest to uh, identify the problem clearly, to figure out what went wrong, and to take steps to rectify it. That would, in turn, reinforce uh, public accountability and trust. The fourth uh, factor is really a culture of respect and this is something I have to thank uh, Prof Lim because he has, as some of you know, he has founded a society, a non-profit organization called Honor Singapore, which is about um, building a culture of honor and honoring. And by uh, culture of respect, what I mean is where people in society, despite differences, respect one another, despite differences in, um, in especially in terms of their views, even the political leanings. And this is so important for having uh, a civil discourse on the issues that matter in society. Of course, as with anything, there may be sometimes uh, carried to extremes is not good. So for instance, if we have a society where uh, people do not feel that they can express their own views because maybe they are overly respectful of the authorities, that also is not going to be very healthy for further progress of society. So having reflected on um, you know, these four factors, where are we in the world today? 
I think it's quite hard, actually, difficult for most countries in the world to actually um, do well in each of these four dimensions. So, for example, we have um, states who have very centralized uh, control, authoritarian states, and they may not fare so well in terms of the checks and balances on the executive, and they could be prone to uh, groupthink, uh, policy blind spots. And by also trying to control the flow of information, I think this also stymies innovation in the long term. But on the other hand, we have um, liberal democracies that are also struggling with social cohesion, and in many instances, uh, losing that culture of respect, which would undermine the foundations for their future success. And in many countries also as well, they're turning insular, um, whether due to political pressures to um, close off um, themselves to talent and ideas and, and so on. But that leads me to reflect on where I think Singapore is, and this is also reflected in my writings, some of the essays in my book. And I'm quite hopeful, and my prognosis of Singapore is a hopeful one. And let me explain very briefly why. Um, I think we are starting from a strong position of trust, both in institutions as well as trust among different groups in society. And we do recognize that we are no, by no means a perfect society and more like a work in progress. And I think there is a healthy uh, dissatisfaction of the status quo, one that uh, sort of empowers people to get together to think about how to build a stronger and better society in a way that is constructive rather than uh, destructive. Of course, many pitfalls lie, lie ahead, but I think I'm quietly confident that um, Singapore can have a bright future. So with that, I'd like to end my remarks. Uh, thank you once again. I'm so sorry to those people who couldn't find seats. I think we can definitely occupy our seats when we move up here. I'm really sorry. And thank you so much once again. I look forward to furthering the conversation. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Su Ling. And I think coming after Prof Lim Seung Gwan and Terence Ho is not a good place to start with. But thankfully, I'm going to just be asking a lot of the questions. With Terence, um, I've known him for a really long time. And if you haven't read his first book, it's really the definitive book when it comes to social, economic, and fiscal policy in Singapore. It's pretty much the Bible that I pretty much advise every other civil servant friend and any young person who's joined the civil service to read um, because it really does provide a very firm foundation and principles to think about these issues. But his second book is interesting because it's a collection of more contemporary issues that Singapore has to deal with. I recall about two years ago when we were grappling with an issue about the implementation of the GST. In retrospect, it seems like a very um, muted response that the, after the GST was announced. But I recall in those days, I had approached Terence to write about it. And at that point in time, it was a hot button issue. It was highly politicized and it was not an easy one. And uh, of course, Terence, being who he is, doesn't ever shy away from a hard question. All of us who know him knows that he relishes the challenge. And in fact, if anything else, he gives us a better answer and gives us more food for thought, or at least a foundation from which to think through these issues. So thank you very much, uh, Terence, for this uh, first two books. I, there are two mics here. So I know all of you have burning questions, but I know all of you are quite shy because we have very uh, smart people in this room. But I, I would challenge everyone to try to ask a good question because I know that you have that at the back of your mind. And we've got uh, Prof. Lim Seung Gwan here as well. So please feel free to direct those questions. But of course, as the moderator, I'm just going to uh, take the honor to cast a few questions. Uh, well, hopefully just one question. But please, uh, when I see you on the mic, I'll just call you. So please go ahead. Um, Terence, so this one is really for you. Your book talks a lot about the nuts and bolts of policy making, and it definitely impresses upon the reader that a certain kind of technocratic leadership is needed in these times to understand the context, the trade-offs, as well as the complexity and the thinking behind some of the policies that we've put in place. The Singapore system is really not easy to grasp, and so I think in you, when you cast our minds to the future and the uncertain environment that we're in right now, um, it occurs to me that we need someone with that depth to draw from. My question, therefore, is do you think going forward that actually the best political leaders are civil servants, senior civil servants? <laughs> do you expect to see more of that in the upcoming general election, which must be held by 2025? <laughs> Well, I think this is a question better answered by the um, politicians and the senior civil servants. Yeah, but I think in any country, I, I think a diversity of leadership will be key, right? So we don't want people just from one narrow background. But on the subject of politics and policy making, I think the two are very intertwined. And for many years, I would say that um, the policy makers have been somewhat shielded from politics because of the um, political leadership was able to set clear directions and really carry um, you know, the ground 
to move whatever policies. So I think um, we were, in a sense, in some kind of te maybe technocrats or policy wonks paradise, able to um, you know think of the long term, avoid the traps of populism, and so on. But I suppose one potential weakness is also there could be um, you know some aspects of groupthink and policy blind spots, despite best efforts to understand the ground and so on. So now that we're moving into a much more contested uh, political environment, I think there are both risks and opportunities. Of course, the risks would be populism, short-termism, and even political polarization at the worst. But there are also opportunities to harness the collective ideas of society and work together for that brighter future. Never fails to disappoint us. Um, Prof Lim, so I have a similar question for you, but on the flip side, given you know your extensive experience in the civil service, looking at today's context, Singapore's changed vastly. We're a first world nation, no longer a third world. It's a more contested environment, as you've pointed out. Um, in advising young civil servants or even senior civil servants today, do you think that they need to factor in politics into policy making and they can no longer be shielded as what Terence has mentioned or hinted at? I'm, I'm not sure that I would, I, I would face the challenge that way. Uh, I, I, I do, uh, you know, I give you a story, you know, when, uh, when I was um, uh, serving in the Ministry of Defence, we were running this international tender to go and buy uh, a bunch of um, military trucks to replace the old trucks that we had got from British when they withdrew from Singapore. Um, and, and it was an international tender to get trucks which are going to be with the SAF for 30 years. Normally you buy this truck 20 years and then you rebuild them for another 10 years. So the trucks have to last 30 years. Um, anyway, so there were three bidders, um, uh, uh, and, and I would say that you know, after we did this life cycle costing, you know, it cost everything for the whole of life, how much will it cost to keep this truck running? Um, and, and we came to the conclusion that Model A is the best, it gives you the best, uh, and, and the best outcome in terms of operational capability and maintainability and so forth. So I went to Dr. Go, as uh, I was at that time the Director of Logistics, when Dr. Go sent up uh, this um, recommendation that we buy Model A. Dr. Go called me up to his office and said, no, no, we don't buy Model A, we buy Model C. Um, and the reason is because he said these trucks have to last 30 years. He thinks Model A come from, come from manufacturer. Uh, he believes uh, they will still be around 20, 30 years down uh, to be able to support the truck up to 30 years. He said, uh, 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 sorry, Model C will be able to do that. Model A, he doesn't think so. Um, and so he made the assessment. So, okay. Uh, here I was, uh, you know, we are all very loyal civil servants, so I left his office, I tore up the presentation uh, so that there's no evidence that the minister ever, uh, ever made a bad decision. Um, <laughs> those were the days before computers, okay, so those were the days where everything has been retyped, you know. And so we went there and so we retyped the whole presentation, this time with all the logic we can give as to why Model C is the best, is the best model. <laughs> You know, if you tell me the answer that you want, I'll work out a, uh, I'll work out a proposal to make that the right answer. Anyway, so we went to Model C, and that presentation, Dr. Go, he called me to his office again and said, no, no, that's not what he means. What he means, he says, give him, the, give him our, our staff um, a recommendation, which was Model A, and he will put a note to the Minister for Finance to explain to him why, as a minister, he looked at it, and although the staff have made their and their, their recommendation and their studies and recommendation, he says, no, we buy Model C. Now, I learned at least two things from him there, okay? First, is because today, there's so much of this practice where if your staff puts up a proposal which you don't like, you tell the staff to change the proposal and in the end, they have to sign their name of something which they didn't believe themselves, mm. right? And what Dr. Go wanted, he says, that if I want staff to be putting out, uh, uh, putting out these things, they should not try to second guess the minister, right? What in your, what, what your studies indicate to you is the right thing to do, and then the minister will have to make his assessment as to whether they make sense. And if he doesn't agree with you, he writes a note and he takes the responsibility for that decision. Is it because if you don't do that, you you are not training your staff to exercise their own thinking and to give an honest, uh, uh, and, and, and their honest conclusion of their studies. So anyway, after doing that, big problem. After all, I tore up the previous <laughs> presentation. So okay, we try, we, we try to recreate it the best way possible to make it an, uh, you know, as close a replica as possible. Send it up to him. He put up the note to Minister for Finance who agreed with, uh, with, with Dr. Go. So what I want to say is that, uh, and, and I see, 
uh, that DPM Lawrence Wong just gave his speech to the administrative service where he told them that as civil servants, you have to write your best proposals to a minister, um, you know, which, which I, I, I thought was wonderful because he's really telling the civil servants, you ought to do and, be, and do an honest job. Dr. Goh also did several other things. For example, if you're the staff officer in charge of something, you cannot write a paper to him without a recommendation at the end. He said, you're supposed to know about the subject much more than anyone else and much more than he as a minister knows. So if you, the person who's supposed to know the most about the topic, doesn't even write a recommendation, there's something wrong with the whole system. So he insists that you must write a recommendation, even though he may overwrite your recommendation. But when he overwrites, at least you learn something. You learn something deep about a different way of looking at the issue which leads you to a, to a different conclusion. So I wanted to say, so far as civil servant is concerned, yeah, it's the job of civil servant to write what is, your, what is your honest view. And if the minister does not agree with you, he takes, a, he takes a responsibility for it. I think that's the right way to do it. At the end of the day, politics is the art of the possible. The minister will have to make an assessment as to whether this makes sense or not, a country as a whole. Because to your earlier question, you know, would, would, act, would senior civil servants make the best ministers? I would say this, you know, my understanding of meritocracy is you choose whoever is the best candidate for the job. You look at the job and you say, what are the requirements for this job and choose the best candidate for the job. That is what meritocracy is about. It's not that if you have the highest qualification, you're the best for any job. You're not. You have to look at the job. So there's a clear distinction between the job of the minister and the job of the civil servants. And so each must do the best that they can for that job. And that's the way by which we get the best value that we can possibly get um, as, as government for Singapore. I want to take you up on your right. mention of meritocracy because that's come up in the president's address, right? And Terence, you can also jump in here. Um, it's been talked about as if uh, meritocracy is something that needs to be tempered, that needs to be adjusted because we need to have an open and a compassionate meritocracy. Do you think we need certain adjustments to be made and did we get it wrong? I'm sorry about it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a good person to answer the question because I don't understand what compassionate meritocracy means. <laughs> I'm sorry. To me, meritocracy is defined by the job. It's not defined by the person's qualifications. And then you choose the person for the job. Does it really require a degree? What does it require? Does it require somebody with a, with a capacity to communicate? Does it require somebody, you know, what does it require? And then you choose the best candidate. To me, that's meritocracy. I, so I don't understand all this compassionate meritocracy thing. I'm sorry, you know, this is, so Terence can answer that. I don't know. <laughs> No pressure, Terrence, no pressure. No, I think uh, Prof Lim really identified the issue. The crux of the issue is what does the terms mean, right? So, I mean, meritocracy, when it was first conceived, has a certain uh, meaning, and it's now come to mean, um, in, the, in the positive sense, of course, that some the people are chosen on the basis of their merit rather than on the basis of, let's say, the family connection or some other thing they, they inherited. So from that point of view, it's hard to disagree with meritocracy, but it's how it is actually practiced whether it's something that's really narrowly based on you know, one's educational qualifications or whether we take a broader view of what it means to be well-suited for the job. Um, the President's address also yesterday was, I mean, it's quite a turning point because it does set out the agenda for the rest of government, for the rest of this term. And the other thing that it, uh, the President did talk a lot about was how much more support was needed to keep Singapore going, to keep Singapore cohesive, and to support the vulnerable in society. Do you think that means we need a bigger government? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't, I, I, don't think, I don't think personally it needs a bigger government, but I do think that, that uh, it is, uh, I think everybody who's involved might, must begin to reconceive what this is about. To be absolutely frank with you, you know, I run through, through Honor Singapore, the charity. Um, I run these workshops where I just bring groups of interested Singaporeans together, and in a workshop, we ask ourselves, what does a successful Singapore look like 30 years from now? And these are just ordinary Singaporeans, you know? And these workshops, I think the smallest was 25 persons, the biggest that I ran was 250 persons. And I tell you what the m number one vote is. The number one vote is a gracious society. 
And this is what they're saying, what the successful Singapore looks like. These are ordinary people, and they're telling you that. It's the, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you track, I mean, there's something else, so my answer will be too long then, but, but let me <laughs> refer you to this book. You know, there's a book called The Hidden Wealth of Nations. It's written by a chap called David Halpern, who was a British civil servant. And he did all this research, which on the basis of his book, because there was something he found really paradoxical. It is this, he says, why is it that people in richer nations are happier than people in poorer nations? which if you just believe it like that, will lead you to the possible conclusion that it's economic growth that makes people happy, or happier at least. But he says, but why is it that people in richer nations are happier than people in poorer nations, but people in richer nations don't get happier even if there were economic growth? And he didn't understand how come. His research came to the conclusion that there's something called the hidden wealth of nations, and the hidden wealth of nations lies in the quality of the relationship among the citizenry. That means the social dimension that makes that. We talk about social capital. To me, that is what social capital ought to mean. And what's interesting is this. He also came to conclusion why governments hardly ever work on this. Because it's the citizens that must produce that result, not the government. Governments like to keep themselves on the economic stuff where you can quantify stuff, you can do all the plans and so forth, when in fact, the strength of the country lies in the quality of the relationship among the citizens. Now, I've been mean, in America, there's that book called Bowling Alone and so forth, so, so there are allusions to it. Actually, if you, if you study also what we call the rise and fall of empires, invariably the rise is a rise for, because of economic growth, the fall is a fall because of social decay. Yeah, not too much I can add to that, except to say that I do agree that the complexity of government is increasing. So therefore, it's understandable if you need a larger public sector, but I totally agree that um, you know, this kind of work cannot rest on the government itself, it will never be large enough, and really requires the participation of um, society and other stakeholders in order to, to make the job uh, possible. So from that point of view, um, having a public sector that's too large also could mean that some inefficiencies where we spend all our time reporting to each other rather than getting things done. <laughs> but in any event, if indeed we agree that that result of social cohesion and all that must be produced by the people, is no point having a larger bureaucracy because larger bureaucracy cannot solve the problem. The issue is how do you get down to the people and sort of say, how do you bring this about among the people? Because that result comes through the people, not through a bureaucracy, and not because somebody is trying to run a four by 100 meter race. You need to understand that. But the challenge is, how, do you, how does the government do that in a way that does not absolve responsibility from citizens? Because only when you step back, then people can step forward, right? So therefore, in order to maintain that size of government, the government, if it wants to do more, has to do some things less. What's the no, less thing they should I, do? I, I don't believe this thing about, you know, if you want people to step forward, you have to step back. I don't think so. What you want to do is to step back and we are all running this race together. You don't want the government to be running behind. You're running with. No, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's easy to do that. You haven't seen the solution yet. But anyway, if we decide for it in Singapore, we'll solve it. <laughs> Parents, how? <laughs> not get away. You know, I, I was going to say, with Su Ling's permission, um, I think there are many people in this audience very well qualified to actually comment on these issues too. We should widen the conversation to, um, you know, gain from the wisdom of the crowd as well and of this very distinguished uh, group of <laughs> attendees. <laughs> The other thing that um, I guess Prof Lim mentioned, which was in, in useful food for thought, was what is the kind of game that we're in? Are we in a relay or are we in a soccer team? Um, but that brings to mind the idea also that ultimately you want your team to win. And in that sense, winning is zero sum because you need to have the best people for the job. We're not a competitive sport. We're, I mean, it's a competitive sport at the end of the day. It's not participatory. And so, I mean, just coming back again to the meritocracy, not to sound like a broken record, but ultimately, what then do you think is the system of meritocracy that we need, that needs 
tweaking at the edges or a fundamental reload, Terence? <laughs> you go first I this think time. it goes back to the idea that we all want to um, sort of progress together and we try to make it as zero sum as possible, but some competition in any society is inevitable because even if we don't compete within Singapore, we are having exposed to competitive pressures of other countries. So I think we have to real recognize this uh, fact of life. But as far as possible, we want it to be collaborative in the sense of helping one another within um, the society to be the best versions of ourselves to maximize our potential. So that balance is something that is not necessarily a contradiction, but is a careful balance and that needs to be worked out. Ms. Proflin, do you want to say something? I feel like you were going to jump in. No, just, 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 take, just take your part about the soccer game and all that. Remember, yes, you want to win, but you want to win against an enemy team. You're not trying to win against yourself. Okay. Of course, you want to choose the best players for your team. That's where meritocracy comes in. How do you choose the best players? Right. But I want to mention something which I haven't been able to check through, so I don't know whether this is legend or this is true. Okay. Somebody tells me in Chinese high school in the old days, every level has this idea about the best class, the best performing class, and, and they've got that building with a clock tower, and the two best classes of every level is that clock tower. Is that true, Terence? You, you're nodding your head all the time. No, I, I do not know whether okay, it's true. Okay, okay. <laughs> now the legend is this, that when you run it that way, of course it's a great honor for that class to be in that clock tower building. And, and the point is, they do not, at the end of each year, go through a whole, uh, you know, uh, as we have this position in standard, and then you just choose the best 40 kids who in the first class, best, next best. Instead, the kids are not changed in their classes. They keep on the same classes. And the legend tells me, so they say that, right, that what happens then is that you bring about a situation where, where if your class if you have the best kids in your class, you are very happy because that increases your chances of being the best class in the level. If the best kids will help the poorer kids and tutor them so they can do better, that's good. The best kids help the poorer kids. So the poorer kids want the best kids in the class. The best kids want the opportunity to move the poorer kids, and that's how the class as a whole becomes the best class. That's a legend. You know, I hope. I wish somebody who knows the past about Chinese high, at least two persons on Chinese high tell me this story, but because they're from Chinese high, they may be telling me a legend also. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a good story. It's a good story. So my point about merit and all that is actually that's for the good of everybody. But you need to get frame of mind. Don't introduce a whole new system and all that because you are not able to write it, write all the rules out, okay? It's a matter of understanding this is how you get the best performance out. This is how you improve your chances of winning. And everybody in the system needs to know that. I thought I saw someone stand up. Oh. Okay, let's go to audience questions now. Hi, thank you, Professor Lim and uh, Terence. Um, I have a question regarding uh, meritocracy. Since we were on that topic, you know, one of the key contentions of meritocracy really is in the idea that privileges and advantages can be inherited, multi generational, which puts people at different starting points. Um, Michael Sandel wrote this book about meritocracy, um, and uh, he wrote it in 2013 about what money cannot buy. Um, in Singapore, we have acknowledged this problem of inherited advantages and privileges, and so we have made available public goods to level the playing field for many. In the next 20 years, you know, since we're talking about the future, what do you think are new public goods that the Singapore government would have to invest in to ensure that we have that level playing field as much as possible so that meritocracy remains something that's alive and well? That's, that's my first question. I've got a second question, if you don't mind. Um, Prof Lim, uh, you were the president of GIC. Today, we still uh, re recognize uh, significant returns from GIC, Tamasic, MAS, to help fund our public spending. <laughs> now, moving forward, do you foresee these institutions being augmented to support increased levels of public spending in Singapore? Do you see new institutions being added to the mix? Um, what is your view of that future? Thank you. 
I can only remember the second question. The first question was so long. Okay. <laughs> but the second question I just want to say is this. To my mind, the most critical question we have to answer concerning whether you can take more money from reserves is this. The current formulation is one which says every cohort of Singaporeans, that means every year or let's say every five years, whatever, you can say every generation. Okay, but the whole idea is this. Every cohort of Singaporeans should be able to benefit from the same amount of reserves as the previous cohort, plus whatever additional reserves may have happened in that time. I don't know whether I'm getting across or not at this point. Now, this is a very critical point, whether you talk generation cohorts every year, every five years, and so forth. The whole idea is this. For your son, the theory is your son must be able to get the same benefit from the financial reserves of the country as you, as your parent, was able to benefit. So the idea is to preserve the real value of that saving. You know, if you run an endowment, you are not preserving the real value. Inflation is going to eat up the value of the endowment. So if you have an endowment and then you take 4% off every year, of, of 6% off every year, and you, and you keep the capital sum unchanged, you know what you are doing. In fact, you're getting less and less value out of it because because of inflation. This is why the government's measure of the GIC performance is about preserving the real value of the capital. And that's the way it's written in the Constitution, that you can take up to 50% of the real returns over the long term. That's the, that's the way it's formulated. Of course, you, you, that's the way it's formulated in the Constitution. You have to express it in formulas which which, which will enable your, your investing um, agencies to get on with their job. So my point is this. So every time there's an argument as to whether you should spend more on the current generation is we have to go back to say, what is the principle and are we disputing the principle? So we have to have the debate about the principle, about preservation of access to the financial reserves such that every cohort has the same access on the basis of if, if the future cohort has less access than the current, then it means the current is taking more advantage of the reserves than they are leaving behind for the next. On the other hand, if the current generation is taking less, then it means then we are going back to how it was in our earlier days, which is really that, that with all the budget surpluses and so forth, that the generations there were, were willing at a time, or maybe they didn't know it was happening, but anyway, <laughs> we were saving the reserves. The big change took place in a big review of our reserves up to year 2000, because before that, the whole theory was, and this is Dr. Goh's theory, you know, it's all, earn all you can, save all you can, spend what you need. That is Dr. Goh's principle for his own life as, o as also for running Singapore. So, so but, but um, I think towards the, in the end of the last century, you know, around 2000, there was this big study as to how much capital, how much reserves do we need? Because a lot of people have this study about, you know, uh, you know are you saving too much and that kind of thing. So how much reserves do you need? The conclusion in that study was that you have three institutions to manage your reserves, which is MES, Temasek, and GIC. Of the three institutions, MES is the most critical. You must make sure that MES is well capitalized. You must never, you must never jeopardize the standing of the MES for doing its job, which is to preserve, uh, to, to, to preserve the value of Singapore dollar. That's its job. Then the rest of it, you say, do we have too much? So first, in 1981, too much was answered by moving that money to GIC to invest rather than leave it to MES to invest because MES is rather more limited to, to being able to take risks on the investments. But the second question after that is, even after you invest, do you just keep saving or can you spend? How much should you be able to spend? And that is where the whole principle of we should be spending it with every generation such that 
every generation and every cohort has access to the same amount. So you need to have a debate about that first. And then we can talk about, <coughs> because otherwise, any government of the day, the most sensible thing for them to do is just take as much as you can according to what the con constitution allows you to take. Of course, why should they, you know, why, why should they leave, leave that behind? Just take it and then you, and then you spend it on, on the people, the generation that's going to go to the general election. You hope they vote for you. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. The, the argument always is why don't the government spend more? Then we are back to you need to have the debate of whether we should run ourselves in such a way that every generation of Singaporeans need, should be given the same access in real terms. That's it. And I've forgotten your first question. <laughs> I'll just recap the first Maybe question. So basically, Terence, okay. you can take this one. It's about public goods and what sort of public goods do we need to level people up in this new Singapore? I think there will always uh, be two aspects to you know, this question. One is really skills that will always be evergreen. Um, we're doing a lot in, uh, in terms of trying to help people take the opportunity in terms of um, refreshing the skills, building the skills for the future. There will always be this return to skills which will remain critical going forward. Of course, the other aspect of um, individual returns is also the accum returns to accumulated capital or wealth. And I think as uh, we progress, with the government will have to think of ways as well to offset some of this advantage. Um, so two aspects, um, keep on working on the skills training and retraining as a public good, and also see how to offset some other advantages that are being passed on through the accumulation of wealth. And on the second question, I really like uh, Prof Lim's framing, that there's both a question of what we ought to be doing, what principles, followed by the technocratic answer to how to achieve them. Thanks. Another question that's popped up um, is the idea of skills obsolescence, um, something that you've addressed in a lot of your commentaries and op-eds. Um, in the way forward, do you think that we need a new model to think about it? You've talked a lot about various kinds of scaffolding to help the most vulnerable, lower wage workers to move up, and also for Singaporeans to keep reskilling. The assumption being that most of your income and wealth will come from work, but Singapore is a capital owning class, and most of us are homeowners. Do you think we need a new model that also looks at how people people's assets can accumulate um, and whether capital is the way to help Singaporeans grow their income? Um, I think we probably need both. I think on the one hand, I think we we'll never get away from the need to have um, income tied to skills as well for the majority of the population. But having said that, um, we have actually also looked in terms of the government looking at building up people's assets from the point of view of public housing and so on. So maybe other asset strategies could then complement the skill strategy as well going forward. I just want to say that uh, uh, at the end of the day, you have to look after the earning capacity of people. So all these things about upgrading skills and all that are very important. But to me, another question which is really quite critical is, again, if I go back to the workshop that I've been conducting, you know what the number two vote is? Number two vote of the successful Singapore 30 years from now is we are highly innovative and creative. First, by innovative, they don't mean block 71 startups only. They mean they want the bus captain to be innovative, the nurse to be uh, innovative, the lift attendant to be innovative. They mean innovative as a way of life, as a way of thinking, as a way people conduct themselves. What? Second, I ask them, particularly the younger Works out. I say, what do you mean by innovative? Is 50% success innovative? And you know, they tell me no. So I was, I, first, I was quite surprised by that. But second, so you know what we boil down to after discussion? By innovative, they mean 10 to 20% success rate. You know what it means? Eight or nine out of 10 times, you fail mm -hmm. to get where you want to get to. Who with a proper brain is going to try to do anything where your chance of failure is 80 or 90%? Think about that. I visited Block 71. I came to this group of people who were so excited about their FinTech. I said, what has been your biggest challenge? Their answer? My mother? <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. The mother said, if you're interested in finance, Go join DBS. They pay you well. It's a secure job. You do this stupid startup. I don't even know whether it'll still be alive six months from now. I understand that. Think about it. 
You know what that statement means to me? Today's parents are not going to produce that children, the children who innovate and create because it is not their life experience. Today's parents have succeeded because they work hard, they follow the rules. And, but if you take what these younger people are telling me through my workshops, that is not the future they see as what, as what um, success is. So how do you do that? If parents are not going to get me there, what's, how do I get there? Then you have to go through the schools and teaching uh, the education system. Then you say education. I check the Ministry of Education. The, average, uh, the median age of teachers in Singapore schools is 34. They are just like your parents. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? So I'm saying that to me, these are deep questions. Sure. If I try to change anything in the school system, it takes me minimum 20 years. Minimum 20 years means if I expect to be switching to a track that makes me do this innovation and creativity track, I must have started doing this in Singapore 20 years ago. We didn't. Okay. Finland had a total revamp of their education system four years ago. And somebody told me, before they started this revamp, they retrained the whole teaching workforce over a five-year period. If Singapore starts changing like that next year, we are already nine years behind Finland. But better to be nine years behind than 100 years behind. It depends what you think. So what I'm saying is that thinking 30 years as opposed to thinking five years and thinking earning power today gives you a different answer. And we need both answers. Of course. You need to look after the earning capacity today, but more critically, you have to get a view as to what is success 30 years from now, because there are some solutions that need you 20 years to even begin to see. That's a different track. Yeah, I have some sympathy for the, the parents of the innovators as well, because uh, as we know, Singapore is an expensive place and people are very concerned about you know the... <laughs> the earning capacity of the kids in, in coping. I think we need stronger um, sort of assurance as well and social support in order to give people that sort of assurance to have that platform to then also express themselves. And that's true, but I was just speaking to somebody today, uh, a teacher who's teaching, to a teaching mate had just resigned and she asked him, he says, you, know, you got a job? No, I haven't got a job. But he's resigning first. You know why that can happen? It's because his father can look after him until he gets his next job. So, <laughs> I know we're at six thirty. I think I see a hand there, and I see a couple of questions. Maybe if you don't mind, we just spend five more minutes. If everyone in the room, take a round of questions, and then we can answer them all at one shot. Yes. Uh, can I just invite you to come to the mic? Yeah, uh, I should inquire. Uh, everything happens for a reason. As in science, the there's a philosophy called dependent arising, where something happens, there's a cause for it. You grow an apple with apple seed. You grow pear, orange with you know, the, the seeds. You, you cannot get an apple tree with the orange seed. So in terms of how we come here, there are several dependent factors, originating arising factors that we come here. Now that we are so prosperous, I mean, uh, there's a sage saying that after being prosperous, what do you do? Educate the people. So we are trying to educate the people. And right now, it seems that education system, especially in the US, bigger and bigger proportion of people are going mad, mental illness. And we are pigeoning, whole, pigeoning them as, uh, pigeonholing them as crazy people. And we ask IMH to do a study. But why do you do, ask IMH to do a study? Because we already blacklisted them as mentally ill, not normal people. Anyways, humanity, social science is not interested in doing a study on these people, normal people who maladapted to society with mental illness. They want to be, they let IMH to classify them as crazy to make a study of that. So we already, you know, outcast them as different from other people, normal people. And how do you get them back to the fold when you already outclass them, where people mass killing in the US every single day, practically every single day. Thailand already had a mass killing. China also had mass killing through knives. 
not through guns. Singapore, we had passion killing. River so Valley. Can I just, in the interest of time, so your question is about dealing with mental health conditions sensitively my, and integrating them into society. Is that correct? Question is how do we have the education of so that we include everybody, we harmonize nature with intellect, they call it Wen Zi Ping Ping, your authentic self and the intellect so that it harmonizes and we don't use the intellect reasoning to outclass the natural tendencies Excellent. of people. Thank you. Maybe you and how do you uh, re-educate the people, have an education system that we can have an inclusive society, harmonious society, that we are happy just by being happy. Aristotle's medicine ethic, happy and happy itself and not because of other things which so that we can be happy. Thank you. I saw two more hands there. Are there any more here? So just the one and two. Okay. So just come up and uh, say your name and a quick question. Uh, quick, quick comment and a question. Comment is, uh, since I run Singapore Track and Field, I had to talk about relays. And uh, Singapore's relays actually do, do quite well, even though our total time is slower than the others, which is a good recommendation for Singapore as a system. So this is a competitive sport. Even though it is simple, it is competitive against other people and we actually do quite well. So that's a comment. I think the question is that I work on my day job in the gig economy. If you think about the past 10 years, this ability to, um, for the government to govern well in areas that have changed a lot, such as uh, blockchain, um, generative AI, gig economy, as well as, um, say, take social media, the speed is so fast. Uh, Terence, you and I have spoken. Prof. Danny is over there. We've spoken about the challenges of the regulators or even the unions to, to understand the nuances of each, well, just take of the gig economy, which is that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Going forward, where we expect that with technology change, uh, nuances will be even more <coughs> difficult to understand, speed of change will be even faster, and your civil servants usually do not have a revol revolving door. How would governing well look like when the speed of change through technology is accelerating even more quickly? Charlene, and then we'll go this side. I had a question um, because both Prof Lim uh, and Terence spoke about trust and respect. Um, recently, there was about a month ago, there was the Edelman Trust uh, Barometer uh, findings that came out, and in Singapore, uh, the people trust the government very much. In fact more than they trust their fellow citizens. And that is a bit an opposite picture of what we're seeing in some other countries where people trust each other a lot more than the government. So um, my question is, how do you um, foresee governing in that kind of situation where people put a lot more trust in the government? And like Su Ling said, if the government wants to step back a little bit for other people to fill that space, um, but that trust uh, might not be there, how do you think um, this is a situation that Singapore can handle? Okay. And then over here, just these two. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, moderator and professor. Uh, pardon my non-scholarly question, but uh, with respect to uh, beyond of Singapore, uh, when do you think Singapore will be in a situation whereby we, as a society, becomes oversaturated? with humans, uh, would the concept of a traditional sovereign state be replaced by perhaps a mega corporations? Uh, what I observe from the street layman view is that the high density, close proximity of human inhabitation in this island has created a lot of problems. Uh, would it be possible for Singapore with its massive resources acquire land on long-term leases, perhaps in Sumatra, in Africa, in other places, to create uh, various satellite Singapores? Because ultimately, uh, for the sake of our material progress, we are losing our human spirit. 
And if you look into the history of uh, successes, especially commercial successes, uh, the victors are usually people with very naughty behaviors. And therefore, again, from my observation, uh, we, we need to bring back the sense of mischievousness, naughtiness, and of the ability to break the rules in order to succeed. Thank you. And last one. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lim, and congratulations, Prof. Terence, uh, for your book. I wrote my question, so it can be quick. Um, I'm Rosa Elena Cortez, and I'm from Mexico. I have over 10 years of experience in the government as a public servant. And uh, my country is going through a difficult time where the most capable people are leaving the government, are leaving public service after failing to improve our situation. Sometimes it's difficult to keep going, to find that inner strength to keep up with the struggles that come with the job. Uh, so based on your reflections on Singapore, a country where we have, uh, we keep seeing its public servants to keep pushing and pushing and rising the bar higher and higher in governability, um, what do you consider are the three crucial, crucial characteristics needed to achieve good governance in times of difficulty? But talking about the inner strength of its leaders, its policymakers, and its public servants. Thank you. So there are five questions, if I can sum it up. Uh, the first one is about mental health conditions and how do we deal with people with mental health conditions. The second question uh, relates to that in that how do we keep that human spirit alive even though Singapore is a very busy, fast-paced and densely packed city. Um, and I guess related to that also is governance over rapid changes in technology, particularly with uh, AI and over social media. Then there are two more questions. Um, one about the, let me see if I can read my own handwriting here. Basically, uh, basically respect and how do we ensure that when there's respect and trust um, between citizens, what does the government need to do to foster that given the Edelman Trust Barometer? And then I guess lastly related to that would be the three crucial principles for civil servants or public servants going forward. So Terence, maybe we can get you to start with the one, the question about the mental health conditions. Yeah, this is uh, quite a tricky issue. I don't claim any special expertise. I think it's something that uh, society has to deal with quite sensitively. I think things are changing. The awareness of mental health and the uh, avoidance of, sort of pigeonholing people um, these all have to um, be addressed through the education system, of course, but also um, through various uh, society, non-profit organizations. I'm very pleased to see Ante here who has been a champion also of uh, mental well-being. I think we really need a whole society effort on this. And maybe if you would also want to take the other questions together or separately, yeah, maybe I just give very brief uh, comments, and then I'm sure Prof Lim is much better place to answer many of them than I am. Uh, technology, I think this is a real challenge. I think we need uh, again back to diversity in the policy process because I don't think we can have a situation where the government has all the answers. Increasingly, we need to bring the experts, and not just the technical experts, but people with uh, different perspectives and understanding. And we need to learn a bit by doing. I think in the area of um, FinTech, for example, I think MES, I'm glad to see our MES colleagues here too. Um, there's always a struggle, of course, trying to protect uh, consumers on the one hand and also leaving enough room for innovation and to keep Singapore competitive. Um, trust in government, I think we need to resist the temptation for the government, therefore, to do everything because we don't have the resources to do that and how to foster the kind of um, civil society groups and other partners and stakeholders and hopefully through the process of bringing people from diverse walks of life together, uh, strengthen that uh, trust between different groups. Um, mischievousness, uh, naughtiness, playfulness, I think this is critical. I think our education system is now trying to leave more room uh, beyond exams for this kind of exploration. It goes back to what I said about uh, we need to be a respectful society, but not overly respectful to the extent that we lose that bit of uh, mischief. Right? And finally, um, uh, the situation in Mexico and what uh, characteristics um, needed for good government, I th governance. I think, first of all, we need leaders, uh, policymakers with the heart in the right place. That's really important. And to um, sort of uh, select and develop these characteristics. And then, of course, we need the technocratic skills, forward thinking, planning, and 
other um, skills of consulting, engaging with the rest of society? Okay, I'm not going to attempt all the questions, but only the ones that I can remember. And anyway, the point about Mexico, uh, I, I, I just remember uh, an answer um, which Ms. Lee Kuan Yew gave when he was asked how to replicate Singapore's success formula. And he said, except for the trauma, uh, except for the trauma of Singapore's independence, which was unanticipated, unplanned, in many ways unwelcome, Singapore would not be what it is today. What he's really trying to say is that if your country goes through, uh, if it's miserable enough, and you have people who are prepared to stay with the country and be the leaders, then, that, then that's where the country will, will transform. The second comment I just want to make simply uh, is that um, I like Deng Xiaoping told Mr. Lee Kuan Yew uh, after his first visit to Singapore in 1978, and he was asked by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, so what do you think of what you've seen in Singapore? Uh, Deng Xiaoping's answer was very good, everything very good, but of course, Singapore is a small place, so we need to understand that. We, uh, we, we are just finding formulas which is good for Singapore, we've experimented, we've succeeded, but uh, we are by no means in a position to tell anyone else, anywhere else in the world, as to how to succeed. But there are the principles, and, uh, and I've recited the principles of governance for Singapore. I think any government that can find within its own context how to get through its principles, which is really thinking about the future, but make sure you do a good job today, thinking about how it is that, how it is you can give opportunities to your people, but make sure they have stakes for the future. No, I mean, any government that can produce that, I think is going to find um, uh, themselves highly trusted by the people and will be able to lead their country to success. But what you actually have to do, that's very contextual, it depends on each country. Uh, if I can go to the earlier question about why don't Singapore think about buying some land somewhere and replicate Singapore, I just want to say this was actually attempted and we actually had made proposal many decades ago. I want to tell you the answer from the country that we talked to on this one, mind you, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and, the, and these country's leaders very extreme, extremely close. They can talk about this, right? The answer that came back after after the other leader had thought about it, he came back and he says, it's not doable. It's politically not doable. So I like, I like the creativity and the imagination of, this, of the thing, but uh, I'm just saying that it is not that we have not tried, but the answer that, uh, that we got was it's not doable, and I don't think we're going to get a different answer now. Um, and then, then there's this question about Singapore and uh, the Edelman uh, Trust Barometer, and that there's very high trust in Singapore. I mean, that's quite a remarkable um, uh, marker outcome. I don't see why the government should work hard at, at uh, reducing the public's trust in the government. So I got no real answer to your question. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, the, I just want to say to more. round up to thank okay. everybody for their time. <laughs> and I know we've gone over time by 15 minutes. I'm sure it's the start of a conversation and you'll all buy Terence's books outside. Let me hand the time back to our MC, Keith, who will tell us what else you, you want us to know before we get out of here. All right, can we just give a round of applause to Pemis? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like all good dialogues, they always overrun. So, uh, Maybe we can invite the three panelists to come forward and maybe we'll just do the unveiling of the, the book together. And then we'll do a photo op. Okay, so uh, you can, you're, maybe on the count of three, I'll just count one, two, three, then you can lift the thing up, right? One, two, three, all right. Uh, at this time, I want to invite the guests of honor, Mr. Yeo and Prof. Danny. Maybe you can come up to the stage and we can do a, a, a photo taking as well. All right, we have many photographers here, all angles covered. Thank you so much. Thank you again. All right, uh, yeah, once again, we'd like to thank you for coming down today. Mm -hmm.